and no. Yes, I have been recording. It has been recording the screen all along, but it has not been recording the voice. So up until now, now the voice is working, but the uh, it wasn't working earlier. Are we still good? I mean, that's mostly a review, okay? Yeah, what I have talked about so far is really a review. It's about the approach of how to study and how to read the material. So, but I do apologize that I forgot to check the audio and now, it's, now, it's, it, now it, is, it is working. All right, so now getting back to the Logisim screen here, okay? So Q of i is R of x i by i, okay? But then at some point, we also identify that R of x i by i in the case of phase two can be done with with can be done with what Boolean operator? Exclusive or. Exclusive or, very good. Okay, so that is important, okay? Because even though you may not want to spend the time to understand the reasoning or the rationale behind it, um, technically, there is a Boolean operator called exclusive or that does exactly this. Okay, this is the this is the link. This is the connection to R of x i y i. So using that, we now go back here and say, oh, okay, we got one exclusive or gate here. That probably is going to go to Q. Okay, and now you know with three of these, you know G is most likely going to go to the end. Right? So now we connect G to the end, which is correct. And then all of these only need to make use of X, Y. None of these would need to make use of K of zero. The question is not wrong in the sense that it does not actually say that every single in tunnel, including K zero, should be used. It just presents to you X, Y, and K zero. It is up to you to decide you know, which ones need to be used. And I think uh, this is Y, so that is Y right there. All right, so main is done at this point, okay? We have already created the, the input pins, okay? The X, Y, K, zero as tunnels, and we have connected the multi-bit gates you know, from X, Y to P, G, and Q respectively. Do we have any questions at this point of the lab? It doesn't have to be limited to just the lab itself. It can also limit. To, it can also be, how do we know? You know how to do this. You know where do we find this and so on. Any questions? Yep. I'm kind of looking ahead, but can mm -hmm. you also technically just switch around a few things and do a three, um, three by three um, um, subtraction? Yes. So that's a very good idea. You know, when we are when we get to the end of this, I'll show you guys how easy it is to turn the adder into a subtractor. It's like super easy. Two changes to the entire circuit turns it into a subtractor. So we might need to do that. When do you just have to change? Um, let me see. Don't you just have to change how P works? How P and G are defined. Okay. Because the only difference between an adder and a subtractor from the perspective of looking ahead, so in order to convert from carry look ahead to borrow look ahead, the only difference is how we define P and G. Yeah, because P is exclusive or exclusive, exclusive X. It's negation of X. Negation of X. Negation of X, negation of X and Y. Yep. And then P of I is negation of X plus Y. Exactly, so or Y. Yep. Exactly. So if you want to turn this into a subtractor, you look at this thing here, and all you have to do is to negate the end that connects to X, like so, and then with this one, do exactly the same thing. Negate the, you know, the connection to X. Now it is a subtractor, or now it is, uh, it has the P and the G defined for a subtractor. Is that okay? So the difference between an adder and a subtractor is really just that, two little bubbles you know, converts it from an adder to a subtractor. But since, you know, the lab is about an adder, so I'm going to work on this as if it is an adder. No, 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 that's great, okay? That that was that was a great uh, comment because, you know, you know, otherwise I would not have remembered to mention this. So that's, that's great. Thank you. Good job. 
All right, so now what do we do? We create K1, K2, and K3. So we go to project, add a circuit, we call it K1, and we'll work on K1 first. So the K1 is coming from uh, the carry look ahead definition. The question actually says pretty explicitly that we want to use the uh, carry look ahead expression to implement the K1. So what is carry look ahead? These are the carry look ahead equations. This is the derivation. So when we get to this point here, this is the carry look ahead definition of K1. It is G0 or the conjunction between P0 and K0. Is that okay? All right. So we just have to look at this you know, uh, equation here and then find out how to do it in the circuit. So the way we do it in the circuit is really just, oh, this is an OR operation, which means we need an OR gate. This is AND. We need, we need an AND operator or an AND gate. Okay. So how do we connect the input and the output? The OR is taking the result of the conjunction, which means in the circuit, the output of the AND gate goes into one of the inputs of the OR gate. So that's how we translate from an expression into a logic you know, circuit structure. All right, so getting back to uh, Logisim, now I'm on a K1. So K1, you know, all the Ks have three input pins. So I can replicate, duplicate, replicate, and then replicate. Now the ordering of these pins is important. So that means you, know, you have to make sure that they are in the order of P, G, K, zero from top to bottom. So, and I think it is always a good idea to label. So we have P here, G over here, and then K zero over here. And then the output is just K one. So it's a single bit of K one over here. So the question is, what do I do in the, in the middle? So when you take the output or when you, you know, get a wire, connect a wire to P, that wire has three bits in it, okay? Which is more than what we need in order to do the, the calculation. Because according to the equation, according to this equation, I don't need G1 or G2. I just need G0, which is bit zero of the input pin G. Same thing with P. I don't need P1 or P2. I only need one bit out of P. So the easiest way to do this, or I should say the only way to do this, is to use a splitter. So we go back here, and then we go to wiring. We pick out a splitter, okay? Uh, since we have three bits, okay? Because X, P and G are both your know, three bit wide, so we need the, the splitter to be three bit wide as well so that the merged end can connect to P and G. But you know, I might as well just have a fan out of three two because this way I have all three bits available to me. If I choose not to use bit one or bit two, hey, that's okay. It is not necessary to connect something to each and every single split end of a splitter. If G zero is all we need, we just need to hook up to G zero, okay? Or bit zero of the splitter. I need to duplicate this because we have two of the input pins have three bits in it. So that means you know, this is how we're going to hook these up. All right. So now we go back to the equation again. We can see that the final gate, the final operation is a logical OR, which means we need a um, OR gate you know, to connect to the output pin because that's the result of the entire thing. So we switch back here, and then we can pull a, well, OR gate is easier. We can just put it from here. And we also need an AND gate, so we pull an AND gate. So I'm doing the same trick again, um, editing both at the same time, you know, saving just a little bit of time, like so. So the OR gate is going to be, uh, the output of the OR gate is the output of the entire circuit. So we just connect the output of the OR gate to K1. We know the output of the AND gate is also going to one of the input of the OR gate. So we just hook that up too. So now the question is, with three remaining input pins, one, two, and three, how should we hook them up? We go back to the equation. 
G zero is by itself. It is one of the things that we or directly. Well, okay. So this is G. This is G zero. So that just goes straight into one of the input pins of the OR gate. And then we look at the other side of the OR. We have、uh, P0 and K0. So now we say, OK, so K0 goes into one of the input pins of the AND, and then P0 goes to the other one. OK, so we wire that up, and here we have K1. All right. Are there any questions about how we how we use logism, how we use splitters, or you know how this circuit is corresponding to the equation that we were looking at in the browser, which is this one over here? So, are there any questions relating the circuit to the expression? Because that is one of the things that I wanted you guys to practice with this lab. Is looking at the equation, looking at the expression, and be able to to translate that into a logical logic circuit. So, do we have any questions about that? Nope. Okay. All right. So we'll move along. <clears throat> so once we have this one done, the best thing to do is to test it first, because you know if my approach is wrong, you know then you know I want to know it as soon as possible. So I go back to main. And then I use K1 as a component here. Now, whether you want to use you know tunnels facing the other way, that's up to you. Some people like it to look nicer and want to do it that way, and other people do not mind you know having wires and running around everywhere. So that's that's a matter of、um, you know whether you're artistic or not and whatnot. So we'll go ahead and just say that well, let's make it look nice. I did not put in the labels. Um, so it's a little bit harder to read at this point because you know the I you know I I remember the location of each particular pin and this one I don't need to, it to connect to anything I just need to look at the color of this. This is supposed to be K one, so if I want to test whether the circuit is working or not, okay, how many test cases do I have in this case as a total? If I really want to exhaustively test. Whether K one is working or not, how many test cases do I have? Yep, four. Close. We have eight test cases. Okay. Now, why do we have eight test cases? So we basically look at the dependency. Okay. This is、um, a common technique of analyzing something. Is you look at the dependency of stuff. So what you do is go to the K1 circuit. You start with the output of K1, and then you ask, what can determine the value of K1? The logic gates, you know, you can kind of bypass those because we want to look at the inputs. So we trace it all the way to P0. Okay, this is one of the bits that can determine the K1. This is another one that can determine K1. But you have to remember, P0 is the disjunction. The disjunction Between x zero y zero, and then g zero is the disjunction between x zero and y zero as well. So that means there are four cases, okay, with the x zero and y zero. So why do I say there are eight possible test cases? Because k zero is also an input pin. So for each combination between x zero and y zero, k zero can be one or zero. So that's why we double. The number of test cases. So there are eight possible test cases just for this circuit here. Are we still doing okay so far with the analysis? Okay. So now we switch back to main, and then we just run through you know certain tests. So、um, we want to see whether it remains zero when it's supposed to. So if I change any bit other than bit zero of x and y, nothing should happen to、uh, k1 at all. Okay, and nothing is happening so far. On the other hand, if between x zero, y zero, and k zero, if I have at least two of those being ones, then k one should become a one. Okay, so I can test that too. There are quite a few cases that can make that happen, but I'm just gonna, you know, try a few. So we have k zero being a one, x excuse me, x zero being a one,、uh, and k zero being a one, and then the output of k one is a one. So that works out. If all three are ones, the output is a one as well. If 
uh, just x0, y0, or 1, the output is a 1 as well. If uh, y0 and k0 are both 1s, the output is a 1 as well. So I think I have done enough tests to give myself a, you know, to build up some confidence that the circuit is working correctly. Okay, so now I can take that circuit and go like, okay, now we need to make k2 and, you know, it would be about the same, just a little bit more complex. So one thing you can do is you can actually duplicate or copy the entire circuit and then just remove the things that you do not like or change your know, things that you do not, uh, that you needs to be changed. I think that's a little faster than creating the circuit from scratch because at least I have the input pins and the output pins done already. <clears throat> and also the splitters, okay? Those we definitely want to keep. So the way I do this is I usually just kind of get rid of all the uh, wiring. So the connectivity would change, but I would keep the gates as much as possible. Okay, so get rid of that, get rid of that. There we go. But in this case, if I go back to what K2 is supposed to look like, this is what K2 is supposed to look like. Um, I got a few questions you know, from the other class about, so which one should we use to implement the circuit for K2? Okay, so that's a question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, oh, I thought, were you asking that as a question to be answered, or were you just asking it in a report? Oh, asking it to be answered, but I was about to answer, but you can answer that too. Oh, we used the last one, G1 plus T1, T0 mm -hmm. plus T1, T0. Um, yep. And why do you think it is the third one? Because in the other sets, mm -hmm. you don't have linear, you don't have dependency on K1. Yep. Well, the first one definitely has a linear dependency because K2 depends on K1. And what what was the whole purpose of carry look ahead? So, we don't have that so that you don't have that dependency. Very good. Okay, so just from the reasoning from of you know what carry look ahead is supposed to do, we can rule out the first one. Then you look at the second one and you say the second one doesn't have any references to K1, but it is still just as lengthy. Why is the second one still as lengthy as the first one when it comes down to how much time it takes to compute K2? Yep. It hasn't been simplified, so therefore you would have to, um, or T1 and G0, T1 mm -hmm. and T0, and T1 and K0. Yep, exactly. So in order to have the logic gates you know, implemented the same way as the second line, we have the first AND gate to perform this operation. When the result of this is available, we can then perform this uh, OR operation. When the result of the OR operation is available, then we can perform this AND operation. When the result of this entire AND operation is done, then we can finally do the OR operation. So if, if you just count the number of your know, gate propagation delay, we have one, two, three, four, instead of just two. Okay. So that also defeats the whole, the whole purpose of carry look ahead. And then from another perspective, it's like, um, if this is already getting the job done, why would I spend the time to talk about the third one? Right? So even if someone does not understand anything about Boolean algebra, just from the perspective of why would the professor you know, derive the expression to the last form, just from that perspective, is kind of leaning heavily on maybe we should do it like this and not like that. Does that make sense? Okay, so you're correct. We should use the third one because on the third one, we only have two stages of propagational delay because the end between these two and the end between these three, they, it, they happen at the same time. It happens you know, within the same um, portion of time. When the result of both of these ends are available, then we have one single OR to finish up the entire operation. Because unlike an expression where you know you are used to, okay, we have to do this sequentially, if we have something or something or something, we can now have a three input OR gate to get it all done in one single gate. Okay, so that's the transition. So getting back to the circuit, this is really helpful because now I know both of these need to be three input, okay? But before I make those three input, I'll make a duplicate of this because I still need a two input one. So now I can select this one, shift click this one so I can select multiple and then change both of these to have three inputs. 
So once again, you know, these are little tricks that you can do with uh, Logisim. It can save you, it can shave a little bit of time, okay, you know, depending on what you need to do. So with a three input one, if I go back to the equation, it would be ending K0, P1, P0. So now I go here, I get P0. It is needed to get into here. And then P1, oops, is going to the next pin, which is here. And then K0 goes to the last pin, which is here. So I have just taken care of um, P1 and P0 and K0. So now we just need to work with P1, G0. So we have P1 already kind of, the wire is already out here. So I'll connect that one to here. And then G0 is another wire. We'll just hook it up like that. <clears throat> and then the one single G bit that goes directly into the OR gate is G1. So we take G1, it goes all the way to here, and then take the output of the AND gate that has two input into here, and then we just kind of stick it here. So now we have K2 implemented. So it is kind of important to change this from K1 to K2, just so that we know it is K2. So at this point, we have two circuits we have created so far. So I would at least just change you know, or add a name and say this is, this is K2 and mention the other one is K1 because otherwise I cannot remember which one is which one and it would take a little bit more work just to differentiate which one is which one. All right, so I'm gonna pause again and see if there are any questions about what I have done so far. Are there any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, um, I want to mention one thing. It is not intended you know, for any individual. If you, if anyone finds the lab, you know, the lab, this particular lab challenging, um, we should probably spend some time to think about why it is challenging, because it is an accumulation of many things. Okay, uh, skills in using Logisim, concepts of all the constructs in Logisim. What is a multi-bit gate? Okay, what does it do? What is a splitter? What does it do? And so on. So there's the Logisim side of competency. And then on the other hand, we also have the knowledge side, which is how do we define P of I? How do I define, define G of I? How do I define you know, Q of I? And then on top of that, we also have to understand what is carry look ahead. How do we define K1? How do we define K2? How do we define K3? And how do we translate those expressions into a structure of logic gates? So there's a lot of stuff involved in the lab. And if the lab is taking longer than the lab period, um, then we have to go back and really try to address you know, why is it taking longer than an entire lab period. Okay, so, but that's an individual thing. Okay, you know, it's for individuals to kind of reflect and find out you know, how we can uh, improve you know, the efficiency of the lab and you know, what we can do to you know, kind of make it a little bit better because I can only say that you know the future labs you know some of those are more complex okay so that means you know knowing how to get these one done you know faster is important so once again you know copy and you know paste to k3 and then we remove all the wiring okay so there we go those. All right. So with this one, I am going to make a copy of this because I still need one that has two inputs. And then this one is going to become three inputs. And then both of these will become four inputs. So now I got all the gates done. And now I just have to go back to the equation and find out what do we need to do. So K3 looks like this, okay? If you can get K1, K2 done, K3 is really just a little more hassle. That's about it. We take all the P bits and end it with K0, okay? So they're all ended together. So uh, let's see. I want to make this look a little bit nicer. So that way you can look. Okay, there we 
go. All right, so we got one done. And then we'll go ahead and connect the output of this or end gate to the last input of the OR gate, like so. So now we are up to the third, the three input end gate. That's going to end P2, P1, G0. So we already have uh, P, okay, what was it? P2, P1. Okay, so we got P2 from this wire, P1 from this wire, and we just need G0 from this wire. Okay. All right. And then the two input one is going to have P2G1. So P2 is this wire. And then G1 is this wire. And then we connect the output of these AND gates to the inputs of the OR gate. Another reason why I'm going over this lab is because today's lab is based on this one. <laughs> so for people who did not quite get, you know, quite getting this one done, you know, this is like a second chance to get it done. Um, and then we have one dangling input of this OR gate, and that one has to connect to uh, G2. So this is going to look a little bit ugly. Okay, but that's okay. There we go. All right, so now we have K1, K2, K3 done. And technically speaking, this is all we need. Okay, this is all we need to turn in and then, you know, but before you turn it in, it is good to test it first. Okay, so that's one thing that we want to do is to test it first. So now I need to move, save this file and move it to the uh, window, Windows virtual machine because I want to show you how to do it in Windows. Um, so we'll go ahead and save it into, let's say the temp folder, we'll call this 3x3CA, can we look ahead? And then we can close this on this side. Now we switch to the virtual machine. Okay, it's still up and running. Yep, okay, that's good. And then we can, so now I have to figure out a way to kind of move the files over. So we'll take a look and see what is the quickest way to do this. All right. I think one way to do this is to sign into my apps.losreal.edu account and send an email to myself with the attachment from one side and then you know just receive that email from the other side. Or I can use Google Drive. Either way, I have to sign in first. <clears throat> yep, of course, send me a push. All right. There we go. Okay. All right, so I am going to use the drive approach. Okay, so there we go. Go to my Google Drive. Yes, it's me. And I'm just going to put it in the temp folder. All right, so on the other side, I have to copy those to the drive as well, to the temp folder. And I have two temp folders. I have to remember which one which is which one. It's not the first one, it's the second one. Okay, there we go. All right, so new file upload. And I call this 3x3ca.circ. And then um, I think that's all I need from here. All right, and I also need the, uh, the, jar, the jar file and also the test driver file. So we'll need all of those. Okay, let me upload all of these from here. It's really important, you know, I think it is important, you know, some people can disagree, which is okay, but I think it's important to test the uh, circuit using the test driver because that's the whole reason why I gave you guys the test driver is so that you can test your circuit before you turn it in. 
So, um, so that's why I'm using uh, Windows on uh, today, so I can show you how to do this in Windows. All right. So let me see. One, two, three, nine. Today is it's a Monday, Wednesday class. Okay. And it's three x three part one. We're looking at the test driver. There we go. All right, and then one more file is the um, the jar file. So I need to upload that one too. I know where to find it too, but okay, maybe we don't need to do it that way. The long way, we can do it the short way. So we have the uh, test driver circuit file, and also the uh, the actual adder circuit. So right click and say download. All right, so I am suspecting it has it downloaded already. Not sure. Yep, it has it downloaded already. Now I navigate to um, get the jar file downloaded. So it's in the shared folder and processor, I think. I can be wrong. Where did I put it? Maybe not there. Okay. Maybe it's just in the in the folder itself. There we go. All right. So we want to download that. Okay. So it's already, is it downloading or is it downloaded? It's downloaded. Hmm? It is downloaded. It's downloaded? Wait, okay. What are you downloading? Uh, Logisim 310. Oh. I can, well, I can always find out. All right, so this is in, this is in Windows. So that means you know, every single workstation here can use the same commands. So what you do is, this is the command prompt. The command prompt is important because it tells you where you are in the directory tree. So if you think about yourself as a squirrel, yes, tree squirrel, and the directory or the folder structure as a tree, this is telling you where you are on that tree, which is important because if you need to refer to something on a different branch, you need to figure out a way to refer to that something on a different branch. So we are now currently, you know, not at the root, okay? If it's C colon backslash, you're at the root of the tree. We are already in the branch users and then in the sub-branch called W00068887. That would be your student ID normally on these computers. So this is where I am on the tree. The downloads folder is a branch down from this path a little bit. So I can do a dir to say, okay, you'll show me where is my uh, downloads folder and the jar file is not here yet unfortunately let me see how we can uh, oh okay wrong wrong browser okay so let's see oh okay could not download why why not let's try that one more time the problem with this is the screen is really small so I can't really see if it displays something somewhere else I cannot see it because that's the only file that I have you know, downloaded right now. Well, well, we'll need to open it and decompress the file. So um, extract all, and we'll extract it to, I'll extract it to a new folder. So we go browse, go to, here and then let me see. Can I create a folder right here? New folder. That's it. Okay. New folder. We'll call this CISP three ten. And then we select this folder. All right. Extract. So now you know, both of those files are extracted into the CISP three ten subfolder. But I still need to go back to the browser 
and see if my Logic Sim 310 jar file is downloaded. It does not look that way to me. Let me go back to oh, this one to the command line interface. Look at downloads again. Hmm? Yep, typo. It's still not there. The jar file is not there yet. Um, <laughs> how do I download in Chrome? Okay. You would think it's just a right click and then download. Okay. And then what? I don't know what's going on. Hmm. All right. You could try maybe downloading it from the Logisim um, assignment that you gave us. Yeah, I think it links to this file too. That's just you know, what it does. Hmm. Yeah, I could do that, but there's no SFTP in Windows either, so I have to download the tool to do SFTP first. So. Hmm. Saved it in your Canvas um, classwork that you provided. Okay, maybe we'll give we'll give that a try. Uh, all right. So go to Canvas, go to the class. I'm not sure whether it is in the folder or the files of Canvas. We can, we'll, we'll find out soon enough. I'd say like in the module files where like it provides, uh, provides instructions for logic. Mm -hmm. Well, I can access the lab. The lab? Yeah. If that link is going straight to um, Google Drive, then we have to, we will have the same problem. Really? Yeah. Is it related to the virtual machine or? Oh, well, I suppose we can. We'll give it a try. <laughs> this one does give me the safe link as option, but that's not that's oh, not if working. If you click on it, it just starts the download automatically. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It would be kind of awkward if this works, but the other method does not work because they're both going to Google Drive. All right. Hmm? Yep. <laughs> hmm. Well, I got ways to do this. It's just you know, kind of obscure. Uh, but I really felt it is important for every person in this class to know how to run it on the command line. So that's why I'm trying my best to do it. Um, okay, we'll, we'll do it the hard way. We'll do a win SCP. You know, I get to, we'll use the SFTP method to get around everything. All right, so. Okay. All right, so we want to find, we don't want to, this is a setup that's not going to work. Uh, we need a standalone download. Uh, or portable version. Portable, there we go. Okay. All right, so that is downloaded. And then we'll extract. All I really need is the application. Extract all and put it there. Okay, there we go. 
Okay, now I have to copy on this side to the power server and then copy from the power server on the other side. So, okay, I can show you all the, all the you know, good stuff here. Um, so it's SCP, um, okay, go back here because I have the path already. SCP is a secure copy, you know, that's basically the counterpart of SFTP. So this is the local file. I have to now copy it to my power server account and we can just stash it into the temp folder because you know it's there's nothing there's no security concern whatsoever. Okay. Enter the password. All right. So this is now done. You know, I have just copied from my laptop to the remote side and now on the on the on the window side, I need to copy it back. So I need to run WinSCP and connect to uh, power arc loadspills.edu, and that's my username, password. Okay, and then we navigate to the temp folder. And then we look for logisim310.jar. Oh, I just need to copy it to the other side. Okay, so we need to copy this to this side. I would it's not responding, but I'm assuming it is trying to copy or. <laughs> or it is asking me a question. I just cannot find the dialog box because the screen is too small. That's the other possibility. Okay. Come on. Okay, it's running. All right. Do you think it copied it? Um, no, that's just that's editing. All right. Okay, let's close Chrome altogether. And then take a look at documents and see whether it's there or not. Nope, not there yet. All right, so we get back to WinSCP. We take this one, and we want to transfer it the other way. I usually don't use GUI tools. Um, Okay, I guess we can just say download to documents. Okay, so it's here, finally. All right, so now we have all the pieces that we need. <laughs> all right, the first thing we want to do is to see if it looks right, okay? So what we do is we run, we run Java. This is all Windows you know, uh, command, so Java-jar. And then you have to tell it where to find the Logisim 310 jar file. Um, that was put into where? I cannot remember. Under documents? Okay. So documents is a subfolder compared to where I am at this point. So I just have to say documents and then the backslash and then the name of the file. Okay, that's all good. And you know this will uh, fire up Logisim in the GUI mode, which is not exactly what I want, but I want to confirm that I can at least do that. And then you know, once we confirm we can do this, then we can open up the um, uh, test driver. I believe the test driver is in CISP310 as a folder. So I specify the name of the folder, which is a subfolder of where I am at this point. So I do not need a backslash in front of it. And now I can specify the test driver thing. And as soon as I do this, it's gonna ask me where is the other file 
So I will help it locate that file, which is in the same, same folder. Click select. Okay, so it all looks good. Okay, it is important to know, to see that this is looking good because if you have any problem, uh, it may give you some red lines, you know, some blue lines and whatnot, then it is not aligned right. Okay, so something is not right about the appearance of the chip. But everything looks good at this point, and I can just go ahead and save it like so, and then I can close it. The idea of saving it is it will save the path to the file that I need to look for, so it won't prompt me again and again. It's a convenience thing. It is not 100% necessary. So now I can actually run it in the command line mode, which means I have to specify dash TTY and then followed by a table. So what this does is it will run it when I press the enter key. It will run it and all the output is on standard output, which is kind of, you can see it, but it's harder to compare because you don't have a tool to easily compare this to what it is supposed to be. So you can capture that to a file. I'll just call it the, the log file. So now everything is in the log file. And then you download the, um, the actual you know, log file, and then you do a compare between this log file that I, just that, that I just captured versus what it is supposed to look like. Uh, one of the tools that I use for this kind of purpose is diff, and diff is only available in certain types of operating system or shells. So what you can do is to utilize a web-based diff tool. Okay, so you basically... Uh, why is it... It's asking me for something. Got it. There we go. All right, so what you need to do is to go for a web div tool, and then this is it. This is one of you know, many that you can use. Okay, I will ignore that. Go away. Stop asking. All right. So what you do is you capture the output, paste it on one side, cap you know, and then capture the output of the downloaded log file, which is what it's supposed to look like. Paste it on the other side, and then you click the button and say find difference. If there are no differences, then the output from your circuit is 100% match with the one you know, that I generated. So you would be so the circuit should be 100% correct. On the other hand, if you, you know, look at find difference and there are differences, then you need to kind of go back and figure out why your circuit is not working 100%. All right, so are there any questions? I do apologize that I had to kind of fiddle with a bunch of stuff in order to get this to work, but are there any questions? Any questions about using the command line tool to do this? Mac OS X is actually surprisingly similar to Linux, so most of the Linux you know, approach will work on a Mac. On a Mac, the only thing you have to pay attention to is the downloads subfolder as well as the desktop subfolders are by default protected, which means Logisim cannot see those two subfolders. So you need to put all your files into a folder or a subfolder that is not a subfolder of desktop nor download. But other than that, you know, all the Linux instructions will continue to work. All right, so any questions about this entire demonstration? I mean, I didn't quite finish this entire thing because this means I have to sign into Canvas, get the file, and then copy over here, do the compare. But I think at this point, you know, most people understand how to get this done. All right, so I'll be doing okay so far. Okay, all right. So if this is all good, then we are switching back to my usual browser, and we are continuing with the content for this class. So once again, you know, my office hour is right after this class, you know, right after the lab, which starts as, so my office hour starts at 1.30 p.m. on Mondays and Wednesdays, but I'm usually in my office you know, before class as well. So if you need to talk to me about anything, you can just go ahead and send me an email, um, hopefully like earlier, um, or you can just kind of knock on the door you know, outside of my office area. Um, if I'm in my office, I'll come out and open the door. All right. So what we are continuing to talk about, um, we have already started to talk about signed versus unsigned interpretation. I hope you guys still remember all that stuff. So what we'll do today, okay, it is already in here, but I'm going to start a new tab here. 
So what we'll do today is to talk about a concept that is important to know eventually, but maybe not as much in this class. But it is still the reason that it's the rationale behind how we can do a arithmetic negation um, in a sign interpretation. So let's backtrack. Let me backtrack a little bit first. So the question is, if I give you the binary representation of 5, how do you find the binary representation of negative 5? How do you perform arithmetic negation? That's the question. Okay. So the method is called two's complement. So I'll go ahead and introduce the two's complement method first, just so that you know, we can get the most important stuff done first. And then we'll go back and talk about you know, how does it work, why does it work. So we go to accessories, go to mouse pad, and there, there we go. Okay. All right, so let's look at five as a representation in base two. So what is the rep what is the binary representation of five in base two? One zero one. So if I want to use four bits, it will be zero one zero one. Okay, but I didn't tell you ahead of time how many bits we were using. So zero one zero one, if I want to use four bits. Okay, and this coincidentally is also you know v uh, s one zero zero one zero in base two four. Okay, do you guys still remember v s as a function? We talked about that last time. It's the, it's the signed interpreter sign interpretation of the value of, in this case, 0101 using four bits. Okay, so we kind of talked about it like that. All right, so two's complement is like this. So C2 is what I usually use to represent two's complement. So the two's complement of 0101 in base two is the one's complement of the same thing, 0101 in base two, and then you, we just add a one to it. So now the question is, what is one's complement? One's complement is the same thing as a bitwise knot, which means everywhere you see a zero, you turn it into one. Everywhere, everywhere you see a one, you turn it into a zero. It is a, it's a bitwise knot, okay? So that means zero, one, zero, one becomes one, zero, one, zero. Okay, so one, zero, one, zero in base two plus one, and that becomes one, 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 zero, one, one in base two. So what this is, what this means is the two's complement of zero one zero one as a bit pattern is one zero one one uh, as a bit pattern. The question is, is it two's complement? Excuse me, is it the arithmetic negation of each other? So if I say, if I claim this number is the arithmetic negation of that number over there, how do you check that that Oh, okay, it works out, and I can now check this and see that they are actually um, arithmetic negations of each other. Does everybody understand what I mean when I said arithmetic negation? Negative 5 is the arithmetic negation of 5. 35 is the arithmetic negation of negative 35. Is that okay? All right. So one thing we can check is to say, hey, if I add these two up, I should get zero. zero. Okay, so we'll go ahead and practice uh, binary addition. So I use zero one zero one plus one zero one one, and I'll do the usual thing. So that means you know, I have uh, all of these rows. Okay. And I'll go, even go ahead and label these. We got x, y, and then we got q, right? So we got q all the way here. We got k all the way here. And then we have the sum all the way here. k0 is assumed to be 0 because we are not stacking any you know, addition before this. So the q is the exclusive or. So that means we have a 0 here, a 1 here, a 1 here, and a 1 here. This place here is the carry of x0 plus y0 and the carry of q0 plus k0. It should be a 1. And then this one here is um, the carry of 0 plus 1 and the plus the carry of 1 plus 1, which is also a 1 here. This is k3. So k3 is the carry of z 1 plus 0 
plus the carry of one plus one, which is also one here. This one over here is the carry of zero plus one plus the carry of one plus one, which is also one here. So at the sum, now we have a zero because here's the exclusive or zero. Zero exclusive or zero is a zero. One exclusive of, of one exclusive or one is also a zero. Applied here and here as well. So now we have the zero back. Okay. So this is a quick demonstration of two's complement or how we can use two's complement to do the same thing as what we know as arithmetic negation when we're dealing with, you know, just a normal type of numbers. Because binary numbers are not critical normal in the sense that you cannot just add a sign and say, oh, we are now, this is the, you know, it's the negative, you know, in, it's the same magnitude, but in the opposite direction. So are we still doing okay with this? Okay. So in the notes, it actually makes sense as well. Because if you look at the notes, okay, there is a table that will give you the interpretation of bit patterns. So if I switch back to the notes here, oh, okay, you cannot see that one. So if I switch back to the notes here, there's a table, and you can see the bit pattern of, oh, by the way, what is the bit pattern of um, 1011? If I use the unsigned interpretation, what would that be? It will be 11, exactly, because we have one, one of one, one of two, none of four, and one of eight. So we have one, we have eight plus two plus one, which is 11. So if I use the table, which is here, and look up, you know, A equal to 11, and you can say, ah, oh, okay, it can be representing negative five. So this table is special because you know, this table makes sense when we talk about you know what is congruent modulo 16 but you know i'm trying to avoid that you know topic first at this point um, but the bottom line is 1011 in base 2 is 11 unsigned but it is also negative 5 signed And negative 5 is the arithmetic negation of 5. All right. So I'm going to take row, you know, now, you know, I totally ignore the you know, taking row. I remember, but I completely ignore that because I was in the middle of doing the lab thing. So we'll go back and just take row at this point. I need to give you guys more time, so I need to change the uh, row taking activity first. All right, so the passcode is look ahead. Okay, so the passcode is look ahead, but I need to give you guys back you know, all the time that you need. So I'll give you up to like noon to get this done. So look ahead is the access code. All right. All right, so I'm done with the lecture today. I will open up the lab also in just a few minutes. But I do want to say that if you feel that you are falling behind in this class, um, for whatever reason, okay, so do not label yourself, okay? I will not label you, so neither should you label yourself. But if for whatever reason you feel that you're falling behind, you know, come to my office hour and we'll, we'll basically figure out, you know, how to kind of correct the situation so that you will not be falling behind. I do not want anyone to be falling behind in my class. All right, so if you're done with this one, we'll go ahead and open up the lab today, which is the continuation of what we did on Monday. But now that you know what the circuit is supposed to look like, you can fix your circuit so that it works at least in that case. So this is um, the part two. So I'm releasing both of those. And I think the date is wrong anyway, but I, let me fix that. Because yesterday when I was trying to uh, release the lab for the Tuesday, Thursday class, I was doing it to this class. So that's why it, they all ended up with the wrong time and the wrong date. So you guys have until 
20 p.m. And I think this one is shorter too. So, so we'll go ahead and change all of this to 1.20 p.m. 1.20. Oh. There we go. The access code is not 3x3 part 2 because you would think it is 3x3 part 2. It's not. It is 3x3b. So that's the access code of the lab portion. Yep. Oh, you didn't change the date for the um, submission part. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing it now. But you have to get through this first. So I have time to fix that one. All righty. All right, so both of these are now released. And then what I'll do is instead of giving you the exact circuit file that I worked on today, I will give you screenshots <laughs> of the circuits. So for people who want to incorporate you know, what I talked about today into your own circuit, you still have to work on it, okay? It's not just gonna be copying a file, but at least you will know what the circuit is supposed to look like. So I'll put it into the announcements, you know, so give me a moment here, I'll do some screenshots and then copy that into here. <laughs> 